Okay. So welcome. Welcome to the last expert talk of this school year. I think we did a great job because we managed to have almost one expert talk every month, and that's great. And so before we start your summer holidays, I know you have exams, you have uh, many papers to correct, mainly the primary school teachers and kindergarten have already finished. We have uh, this last extra talk, and it's going to be, as the previous one, uh, this year we did a lot about uh, science education. So we are going to have a talk about math. Math is a project, a European project, which means making science really in schools. So we're going to see some best practices for creative STEM classrooms. And I would like to thank our experts. So we have with us Sofia Papadimitriou. She is uh, working in education and radio television in the Ministry of Culture, Education and Religious Affairs in Greece. And she we also have uh, another presentation, which is called the Primary Learning Assistant uh, by um, John Hiotelis, who is a physicist, teacher, and then we are going to talk about the life cycle of invertebrates. I suppose that uh, the STEM teachers can understand better all these uh, words, so we are going to have Marina Lanzuni, who is a biologist, oceanographer, oceanographer and uh, they are going to share with us uh, some very interesting things that they did in their class. Uh, I want to thank them all for organizing that uh, together. I don't want to say much more. I just want to inform you that uh, we will start with Sophia and then uh, John. And after that, you will have some time to uh, ask your questions before we go on with uh, Marina. And you can ask the questions to Marina at the end. So, thanks once again. And I'm just passing the ball to Sophia. Here you are. Thank you very much, Rini, for inviting us uh, to this active and enthusiastic community. I'm very glad to be here with you. And we are going to present you uh, the March project about making science real in schools. Uh, we're trying to explore best practices for creative STEM classrooms. Uh, the March network, the Making Science Real in Schools network, consists of nine partners that come from seven European countries the UK, Greece, Germany, Serbia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and Portugal. The key objectives of the network are to improve perception of science in secondary schools, to increase the number of young people who choose a career in science, to help young people to actively contribute to the learning process, to increase skills in teachers for engaging creatively with their students, and for delivering innovative methodologies. Uh, how, which steps should we follow to reach these goals? Uh, here in the beginning of the slide, you can see the URL of uh, our projects, sciencemarch.eu. Uh, the first step uh, we follow is making full use of the results of the March research, which records the state of the art in seven participating countries. Uh, from national workshops, we collect good practices from teachers and share them in international swap workshops. By organizing conferences and webinars like that today, uh, we disseminate and promote experience and expertise, achievement uh, reached so far from the project, and the challenges that emerge. Uh, we are going to implement the pilot classes with the forthcoming uh, school year. Uh, let's see in the beginning the results of uh, the March Empirical Study. The objectives of this study uh, were to review the current state of science education across Europe and to map the state of the art of students and teachers' perceptions and opinions of uh, science teaching. Uh, the work was led by Forum Democrati in Bulgaria, and the scoping analysis was based on desk research on existing policies, practices, and methodologies, online surveys among teachers and students from uh, the seven uh, participating countries in the project, in-depth interviews with relevant stakeholders, and it was held from 15 of May to 30 of October uh, previous year. Uh, the key findings of this um, uh, uh, study 
uh, let's see them some key findings. Uh, we can say that uh, science education is still much more theoretically based than focused on hands-on practices. Even in leading countries, the respective policies have not provided the expected results. We can see here in this diagram the students' participation in experiments. Uh, it is uh, uh, the, in red and in uh, green we can see the percentages are low uh, for participating uh, in experiments in classroom and uh, in uh, the vast majority of countries we have about 40% uh, as an average of student experience uh, they don't prepare a scientific experiment and present it uh, on the class. They have not uh, got this experience. Uh, so we can generally say that students learn only facts without getting functional low knowledge, uh, that it would help them to solve practical uh, real-life problems. Uh, Another finding, uh, students think that uh, they don't have enough laboratory equipment. Uh, there are some big differences uh, within countries. We can see here that uh, the UK, uh, students in UK think that uh, they have enough uh, laboratory equipment and the same in Portugal, here the green one, the bar. Uh, but uh, in Bulgaria, uh, Germany, Greece, Portugal, and the Republic of Serbia, uh, students think they have not uh, enough laboratory equipment. Uh, that is not the same as their opinions uh, regarding computer equipment in school. Uh, three out of four students think ICT infrastructure is enough, and here we have no big differences within countries. Uh, Regarding um, the resources they try to uh, find uh, to support their work in STEM, uh, when we speak uh, for STEM, we mean uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, all these uh, topics. Uh, the web uh, is the absolute resource for students, and the vast majority um, uses uh, user Wikipedia as uh, resources, as uh, uh, resources for, to support their learning. Uh, they search the web uh, uh, search engines, browsing the internet uh, generally, and so we can say that uh, a particular attention is required in training students how to recognize accurate and reliable uh, science information. Uh, students recognize the importance of science for their academic and professional future. We can see this diagram uh, which connects uh, the science, uh, the, their performance science with the university of their choice. Uh, here in the blue bars we can see uh, the big percentages uh, for their academic future and here the same for uh, uh, relating science with uh, jobs. Uh, so the rise of science uh, and the technological breakthrough due to the rise of science um, seems that uh, students uh, recognize uh, uh, this effect and uh, the tremendous and social uh, and economic impact from science. Now, uh, uh, we organized the first international conference in Athens uh, last November. The conference aimed to explore best practices in schools, achievement and rent, the relevant European projects and networks, uh, with individual and group presentation, discussion panels, and there were two happening, uh, one for stand-up science and one about science storytelling. Uh, the local workshops uh, organized in all participating countries brought together teachers, students, and researchers uh, focused on methodologies and content educational that could make science teaching exciting and attractive to young people. Uh, these photographs are from Athens workshop last March. Uh, Already, uh, we have organized two international SWAP innovation workshops, one in Lithuania in Vilnius and one in Portugal in Lisbon. 
uh, student role there in these international workshops uh, was central uh, because they offer their insight to approach uh, uh, whatever they find attractive or not. Student teachers, uh, policy makers, and researchers interact in the SWAP workshops and share their experience in groups trying to explore uh, the following question. What makes science real in schools? How to attract young students to STEM, to topics of STEM? Uh, after one and a half year of implementing this project, we have pointed out uh, good practices and also organized these good practices in the following categories. Uh, the first category of good practices is going outdoors. Uh, we have a presentation afterwards about uh, uh, this category of practices. Um, there is a need for linking science educational content to real life, to observe, to explore, to make measurements, as we can see here in the nature, uh, to explore about uh, silkworms and snails growing, uh, or uh, botanic garden conservation. Another category, a second category, uh, is uh, uh, interacting practices, good practices uh, about interacting with researchers. Students here act as little scientists in uh, real experiments uh, by the side of researchers. They better understand the exciting challenges uh, which faced by scientists and researchers. Uh, and so um, researchers share their expertise and could be promoted as role models. A third category of practices is uh, uh, using media, creating new media. Uh, we can see here some uh, um, application with uh, Web2 tools from the second web, uh, generation of the web. Uh, so we use here new media to enhance creativity. Uh, here is from the School Lab project, a very successful project uh, in Greece. Uh, students here presented their scientific subject in a video uh, in a simple, creative, and fun way, including uh, sometimes experiments, all sorts of plays, theatrical plays, narrations, songs, and dances. So they gain self-confidence and presentation skills. Another category has to do to com combining science with art. Um, here students are encouraged to creatively produce uh, artwork on STEM uh, topics. We work here in the revised Bloom's taxonomy to the upper, level, upper levels of analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Uh, two subcategories of practices is the getting hands-on um, practices, uh, where uh, students uh, use their hands to make robots, to construct uh, uh, robots or other uh, uh, similar constructions to do experiments. So they build common projects and work on a common purpose or vision. Uh, here is the same with uh, Bloom's uh, revised taxonomy. We work to the upper level of analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Uh, a subcategory of uh, the new media, the use of new media, is coding. Uh, most teachers consider coding as an introduction to teach problem solving, and ICT teachers uh, usually call it uh, algorithmic thinking. Uh, and we can say that it is true because many courses start off scratch, we can see it here, uh, or go on with Lego robots and try to break down complex reasoning problems to smaller ones. Uh, for regarding methodologies, the MARTS project, uh, um, we have uh, these key methodologies. We have approached these key methodologies of inquiry-based teaching strategy, the problem solving, experiential. This is, these all are usual uh, methodologies uh, when we speak about STEM topics, but uh, there are um, two additional methodologies uh, emerged from uh, our work. Uh, one of them is uh, the six sticking hats methodology. Uh, it is uh, by Edward de Bono, who describes uh, this methodology, a tool for group discussion and individual thinking as well. 
to think together more effectively. Another uh, uh, methodology, uh, very uh, trend uh, this uh, uh, time, uh, we can say it is uh, the flipping classrooms methodology, an instructional strategy, and a type of blended learning that uh, reverts the traditional uh, arrangement by delivering instructional content outside of the classroom and moves activities into the classroom, the active part of learning into the classroom. And uh, uh, instructional content often online uh, happens outside of the classroom. So uh, we have to combine, to connect all these practices uh, with uh, these methodologies in blue. Uh, some, um, uh, every practice we can say that uh, can be aligned with the methodologies, with each of the methodology, and uh, both practices and methodologies um, we can say are mutually supportive. Uh, a question uh, now we have uh, to face, we face, is how to connect methodologies and practices under the theme of sustainable cities. Uh, after uh, the Greek workshop in Athens, uh, there is a proposal from uh, 11 Greek teachers, uh, STEM teachers, uh, how to combine uh, some methodologies as inquiry-based learning, problem solving, and uh, some practices uh, as new media uh, to a best practice called light pollution, a historical study on a modern trait. The next step of uh, our project uh, is uh, the third international SAP innovation workshop, uh, the second international conference in November, uh, and uh, we are organizing a series of webinars like this one today uh, and uh, planning plan pilots in uh, seven participating countries for with the forthcoming school year. And we are looking forward to have you with us in our webinars and maybe if you are interested to participate in the pilots. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm giving the floor to... Mr. John Sotelis, uh, to present you the Galileo's assistance practice. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, good evening to everyone. I would like, of course, to uh, thank Sophia Dimitriou for uh, the invitation to present my uh, scenario to to all of you panelists and uh, the attendees. Uh, of course, I would like to thank also Ian uh, uh, Pachiraki for hosting and helping us with um, this uh, webinar. Uh, my uh, inquiry-based educational scenario is titled Become Galileo's Assistant. Uh, and uh, uh, based on this uh, scenario, we want to uh, um, um, transform our students into little researchers. Uh, if we ask a primary uh, student uh, about the, our planetary system and uh, whether the sun or the or earth is, if it is in the center, they will of course uh, answer that the sun is in the center and of course earth rotates around the sun. But uh, when this uh, um, knowledge uh, was uh, proved scientifically, and of course by whom. So we asked uh, students to become Galileo's uh, assistant because Galileo was the first that uh, uh, provide us the best evidence that uh, uh, sun is in the middle of, uh, of our planetary system. Uh, this scenario is mainly referred to students studying physics and astronomy aged 12 to 18 years old. Uh, we need a science lab or a computer lab, uh, co internet connection, and of course, two free to download uh, software tools, uh, uh, the Stellarium and the Salsa J. The duration is six hours, and uh, the, the teacher must have a knowledge of physics and astronomy. Uh, this scenario also involves hands-on learning, inquiry-based learning, ICT, 
and uh, of course a lot of uh, research in literature by bloggers, by bibliography, internet, and uh, of course using of uh, software. Uh, um, this image uh, has uh, actually a very uh, a great interest because we can see that the Earth is in the middle. This is actually the uh, geocentric model uh, presented and uh, proposed by Pto Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic model. Uh, it is very interesting to see that uh, uh, instantly after Earth uh, there is Mercury and then Venus and then Sun. According to this image, we ask uh, students to um, to say whether they believe that uh, Venus will uh, uh, show some kind of phases like that uh, the Moon presents, uh, the Earth Moon presents. Uh, of course, students are uh, a lot of um, uh, confused with these images, and so we can provoke their curiosity, the first step for an inquiry-based scenario. Following and uh, knowing to, and wanting to, aiming to uh, rise their uh, former knowledge, uh, to recall their former knowledge, uh, we ask them to, to find out uh, which were the opinions of Aristotle, Hipparchus, and Ptolemy about uh, our planetary system. And of course, we also ask the contradictory theory of uh, Copernicus and Aristarchus about the planet, planetary uh, system. Then uh, we present to the students, we send to the students uh, a letter from uh, a, a former student of Galileo called uh, Benedetto Castelli. Benedetto Castelli, knowing the, uh, the existence of the marvelous glasses, uh, actually the telescopy of uh, Galileo, asked his uh, teacher uh, whether uh, he can uh, observe faces of uh, Venus. If uh, someone can observe faces of Venus, then this is the ultimate evidence that the uh, Sun is in the center of our planetary system. So uh, they can present this knowledge, and of course uh, against the uh, knowledge that was uh, that period of time uh, power about the, 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 the geocentric system, the Ptolemaic system. Now students are called, to, by using the solarium, to become the researchers. Celerum gives the opportunity to, uh, to the users to, to go back to time, to become, uh, to, to, to live in, on December 1610 in the laborat laboratory of Galileo and of course at, uh, at uh, Italy, where they can of course observe and watch the night sky that actually Galileo was watching. This is actually a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity of this, uh, of this uh, application. By using this uh, uh, sequence of uh, in instructions I, prov I am providing in my scenario, students, and by using the for fast forward button, can watch for a, a two years period all the phases of Venus. This is actually the ultimate evidence that uh, Venus is rotating around the sun, and we have to accept that the sun is in the center of uh, our planetary system. Students are called to fill uh, uh, a table like this one presented in, uh, in my presentation, uh, showing uh, uh, the phases, the time, and of course the magnitude uh, of luminosity of Venus. Then they are to plot as a uh, um, representative uh, plot graphic. Uh, of uh, the uh, luminosity of Venus, uh, which is actually related with the image presented in my um, uh, image here in, in my uh, uh, in my presentation, uh, which actually reveals the truth that Venus is between Earth and Sun. Uh, this actually was the ultimate evidence that uh, the Sun is in the center of our planetary system. Of course, uh, all the planets, uh, as Venus and Earth, are rotating around the uh, uh, Sun, so Earth is not uh, anymore in the center of uh, our planetary system. Of course, we want uh, further uh, students uh, to become further um, research and inquire about uh, uh, what Galileo did. So we ask students to observe the moons of uh, Jupiter, which was, which was another one of uh, his uh, great achievements. 
scenario more for the special opportunity, but also by uh, downloading images from internet, they can, uh, uh, real images uh, uh, taken by telescopies, they can, uh, uh, by using the SARS-CoJ program, they can create a mini animation that shows the rotation of, uh, uh, of the moons of uh, Jupiter around this uh, gigantic uh, uh, planet. Uh, I provide uh, full instructions for this uh, uh, procedure, and I think it's quite easy uh, as far as it concerns my experience. I can guarantee it is. Uh, finally, <laughs> we ask students to reply to Benedetto Castelli and uh, uh, send a letter back. Uh, and, of course, we are presenting the, the Galileo's letter that uh, he claimed, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, my student, uh, Benedetto Gastelli, of course, uh, signs in the center of uh, our planetary system and then rotates around the sun. But, uh, you know, it is uh, very difficult to convince people that they don't want to be convinced. So keep the truth for yourself and... Uh, uh, try always to be such uh, a good scientist, such a uh, uh, scientist that uh, you are always trying to find the, 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 the truth and, and knowledge. Finally, as a follow-up activity, of course, uh, uh, we can propose students to further uh, uh, investigate, further uh, look for uh, um, uh, uh, some uh, knowledge uh, related to our planetary system, as, uh, for, for instance, the moons rotating around uh, the another gigantic uh, uh, planet, Jupiter. And uh, as uh, I can uh, guarantee you that students always uh, adore to play with, to play, okay, with this uh, program, with this very uh, interesting program called Stellarium. Uh, thank you all for your attention. And uh, I wish uh, great uh, um, efforts and uh, great uh, um, uh, times with your uh, students. Thank you. Thank you, John. It was uh, really interesting. I don't know oh. if you have if uh, the participants have any questions that they would like to ask. Okay, uh, I'm passing the ball to Sophia then. Yes. Okay. I already passed the ball to Sophia. Okay. So, any questions? Especially the STEM teachers that you would like to ask? Can I ask something? Okay. I'm not a STEM teacher, but I would like to ask that you are piloting this in seven countries, you say, that seven countries are participating in that project. Uh, so this means that the participants should only come from these countries if they want, you know, to participate in a pilot or, you know, take part in any way. I don't know if you have heard me. Sophia's microphone is uh, turned off. Minute. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. for uh, the seven participating countries, uh, uh, it is uh, compulsory to run the pilot, all of us, uh, but if some, someone else from other country would like to participate, uh, he's more than welcome to run the pilot. Uh, we are going to begin the pilot uh, the first coming uh, year, school year. So we are looking forward, uh, if some of you would like to run some uh, uh, a combination of practices with uh, these methodologies we have discussed previously. Do we have any questions here at the chat? Uh, we can go on maybe to the third presentation and have an overall discussion after Marina's presentation. Okay, so Marina has the floor. One minute. Okay. I have the floor, I have the ball, I have everything. You have everything. <laughs> 
sorry, this is the third one. We should begin with it. Okay. So, our, our project is called Live Streaming, the Life Cycle of Invertebrates. Invertebrates, uh, for those that don't uh, teach biology, are the insects, the mollusks, the um, worms, all these animals that don't have a spinal cord. Okay, so before we start, I'm going to take a quiz. Do you know what this is? I can see answers in your in the chat, but if really, do you know what it is? Uh, you have okay. See, yes, yes, you can see. Yes, it's the butterfly. It's the moth. Actually. <laughs> No, it's not a fairy bunny, it's not a spider, it's a moth. Actually, uh, it is a silk worm. Um, in case that you don't know in your language, here you can say the word of, uh, the, uh, the noun for silk worm in some of languages that I found out, Biden, Stina, in Deutsch, Bernasois, in French, and everything like that. Okay, so. Our project was about the reproduction and development of silkworms and snails. So, let's see how it all started. I don't know if you know this man. Uh, it was around 5,000 years ago. He's the Yellow Emperor of China. And he was married. He was married to many wives. So, one of his wives was taking the tea under a tree. And suddenly, something, hello, this thing, this little white thing, so she tried to take it off and uh, started to unravel a soft thread, a very, it was very nice, a warm sensation. It was silk. She figured out that <clears throat> inside this cocoon was a little worm that uh, created all this silk. So she took it back to her palace and she taught all the women in the palace how to breed the silkworms. And it was a secret. It was not supposed to go out of China. And actually, it didn't go until uh, Byzantine Emperor Justinian um, sent out some monks, which they, they discovered the secret. And actually, they managed to take home back with them some eggs hidden in their hollow walking sticks. So the secret was not a secret anymore. Here, you can see um, some uh, silkworms out of the, um, that they were just born, born, that, sorry, they just, they were just born from their egg. These are the gray things are the eggs. Uh, here's what they look like after one week, let's say, and here's what they eat. They only eat mulberry trees, leaves from mulberry trees. Uh, so, let's here is the life cycle of a silkworm. Uh, since it's uh, from, Chinese, from China, it's anti-clockwise. And uh, you can see here the eggs, and then um, what they do is that they eat and they sleep. And they eat and they sleep. And when they sleep, they go through the molting, molting procedure, and they become... Uh, they go out as a next instar, so you can see that they have five, five, sorry, five instars, five ages. And uh, after that, they start staining the cocoon. And they transform to a pupa, and then uh, the moth, which is the, the silkworm. So, what do we need? What did we do in the classroom? For the snails, because we also did the snails, I forgot to mention. Uh, here is what we needed was a simple terrarium, let's say a plastic box. We need a wet towel for the humidity. We need a transparent cup with eight moss so that the uh, snail It could be about the feeding preferences. What do snails eat? Uh, it would be, it could be the growth rate, how fast they grow. Uh, we could just observe mating. 
we could uh, fi try to find out the correlation between incubation time and temperature. For the silkworms, we need a shoebox, we need silkworms, either in eggs or larvae, we need mulberry leaves, or if we don't have mulberry trees in the region, we can buy from pet shops some mulberry toe, or we can try to make uh, our own. We also discussed the aim of the experiment, and we create the appropriate workshop. So what is it all about? What do, what do we do? Why do we do it? It's about biology. And you can see here there are many fields of biology that we can uh, study. It's reproduction. It's reproduction, we can see mating, egg laying, incubation, hatching, the metamorphosis. We can study the skeletal, skeletal and muscular system. We can see the movement. We can see the exoskeleton. We can see the hydrostatic skeleton. That means that um, men should not want to play with the uh, antennas of the, of the snails, and they can see how they grow back. Uh, and then we can also see the mountain. Taxonomy. Uh, many of you didn't know the invertebrates. Now you get to know mollusks, which is a snail, and arthropods, which is the um, silkworm. The digestive system. We can uh, study the mandibles and other mouth parts. We can see the gastrointestinal tract. We can uh, discuss about uh, monophagy, or monophagy, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Or polyphagy, that means that, uh, I suppose you know, um, silkworms can eat only eight mulberry leaves. Snails can eat almost everything vegetable, even if it's fresh, even if it's rotten, whatever, everything. And we can also discuss the respiratory system, the circulatory system, nervous and sensory system. Furthermore, we can discuss, uh, we can engage with other sciences, like, uh, let's say, mathematics. What do, how do we, how do we, sorry, uh, how do we work out the uh, growth rate, let's say, uh, with technology. We can build more terrariums, we can learn to do more stuff. Computer science, where do we store the results? How do we share them? We can create some time-lapse videos and we can upload them. We get to know the local history. In many regions, silkworm breeding was um, a very uh, popular source of income for um, three months every year. That's why we can also engage with career education. Healthy culture, which means the snail breeding, is, let's say, um, innovative. Um, occupation. Sericulture is an old occupation that is uh, growing old and should be, maybe should be gener regenerated in the near future. So let's see what our, ah yes, now it's the time for our time lapse video. I will ask you to go to YouTube, just give me a second. Uh, here we are. Come on. Here you can see a link in the in it's actually it's my husband's YouTube channel. And we just uploaded um a video, a time lapse video. If you can please we'll go and see it. You can see how the silkworms I don't know if anybody, anybody has done it yet. Okay, I suppose that you are watching it, and each second uh, represents, let's say, uh, something like two hours and 30 minutes, two and a half hours, and you can see the, uh, you can see the silkworms growing, and eating and growing, eating and growing. You can see the new leaves that we put so that they can eat, and uh, so on. Okay, so I guess that you are watching it. That's very good. Um, okay, it's, uh, it goes for one minute and 42 seconds. It's obvious that you will see that um, 
uh, from uh, a minute, uh, one minute, nine seconds. We missed three, four days because the cell phone was not working. So uh, we missed some of their development. But you can see, and uh, if you want to fast forward it and take it to around 120, you will see at the top uh, left corner one uh, silkworm that they started spinning the cocoon. Okay. Actually, I, I must not lie, uh, students didn't, didn't participate in this, but this year, uh, reproduction in uh, the major of biology was not taught in any of the uh, Greek high school classes due to a um, swap in the um, uh, subject, and uh, they will do it next year. So it's only me this time, but last year we did it, we didn't know how to time lapse. This year, I knew how to time lapse, but I didn't have students. Okay, so let's go on. Here you can see a picture of all three stages. Uh, you can see the moth, you can see the cocoon, you can see the, uh, the big silkworm and fifth winter. You can see also the, both of them mating. And let's see what else we have. Here you can see a factory of uh, silk factory. In Greece it was very, oh yes, here we have it. A grandmother used to work in that field caring for silkworms. Many, many families used to do that. You are right, Giacosa Bruna. Sorry if I don't pronounce your name right. And uh, it was funny because all, uh, during spring, all the furniture from the house was um, uh, taken into only one room, and the rest of the house was like, right, like that, only for the um, silkworms. Next, okay, let's talk about the snails as well. You can see the snails mating. You can see a snail here laying the eggs. It, that's what actually the children can see. And here you can see the baby snails that hatched out of their um, eggs. Uh, here are some numbers, but I don't think that we care about them. So what are the results? Uh, except the, <laughs> some, the cocoons that we have. We connect with nature. We have enthusiasm. We discover. We have the scientific method in action because we ask the children to ask the question and then give the answer the scientific way. Children explore. Children learn to follow protocols. They become responsible. They handle living organisms. They have interaction with local communities. And also they bring back memories of previous generations as, have, as it happened right here with a participant saying that his grandmother used to work. And now what? What are our next steps? Okay, maybe we can build a spinning wheel. Maybe we can extract the silk strands with the students so that we can actually see how it's done. We can create mulberry shows of red silkworms at winter. That's the, um, uh, the what's the opposite of the advantage? The disadvantage uh, of uh, raising silkworms. They only um, you can only do it in in spring. But this year we'll try to prepare some mulberry shows so that we can have them during winter. Uh, actually, we will create more time lapse videos. And we will have a cook and eat snails project because snails are very healthy and people don't know it. And when I created this uh, project, I was asked, why do you think this practice is innovative? Innovative. Well, actually, it's not. I consider it, and I consider it traditional. And they also asked me, why do you think this practice is attractive? Well, because it's about experiential learning. And as probably not Benjamin Franklin, but it is attributed to him, so he said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me, involve me, and I learn. Thank you for your attention.
I will give the ball now to Irene and become Noah. Uh, thank you, Marina. I have to say it is very interesting. And I had a similar experience uh, because last year we had uh, a teacher who had cocoons in our uh, conference, the National Conference in Patria, and she gave me five of them, and we tried to have butterflies from them with my knees. We managed to have two very weak butterflies, but anyway, it was, you know, it was really nice, starting with, you know, with the... So how do you call them the worms, the small ones, you know, before they make the cocoon? Before the cocoon. Larva. So we have that. We started from the beginning and it was really exciting for a child of nine year old to see, you know, all the process and how this works. So I had my own experience on that and I agree that it's really fascinating. I tell you the truth here, Irene. I got involved with the flute world when my second son, second daughter, went to first grade and her teacher had the flute world. And that's how I found out everything about them. And I, it was so fascinating. And I brought it into my class after that. Mm, yeah, that's really nice. So I don't know if uh, you have to ask, uh, you want to ask any questions? So you can do that, you can use the chat or I, you can just raise your hand and... I can see in the question, uh, Rima, can you hear me? Yes. I can see in the question uh, from one participant about uh, the Scientix uh, uh, portal. Uh, yes, um, if we, we have uh, made some connections, uh, we are familiar about uh, the Scientix network. And we have uh, been connected with it. Uh, and uh, Scientific is an umbrella project about uh, all STEM projects. And uh, you can see um, our resources and good practices. We'll spread them uh, at the um, uh, portal of the Scientix. And also, uh, you can search there for our pilot at the Scientix uh, uh, portal. Okay. Okay, so anything else? Any more questions? I say that they have already ideas and they were talking about projects that they would like to run. Mm -hmm. Where everything so clear so you don't want that sense? I'm searching the chat. So, I think this uh, outdoor activity is uh, could be implemented maybe and in uh, primary education. What do you think, um, Marina? Yes. We can have it also this in primary education. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes. it also works well even with the senior high school because they study, they study, and they don't know. What is this thing that they study? They know, they know biology from books, but not from biology. Mm -hmm. Biology is why? It's a By the nature. Yes. yes. Biology is in front of us everywhere. Eh? <laughs> but it is a difficult topic <laughs> to explore. So there is a question, if it's easy to use SALSA program? What program? What program? SALSA. For, for John. So this is a question for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, SALSA J, uh, although it is a professional uh, tool, it is uh, very, very, very easy to, to be used by students and it's quite uh, 
familiar to them. I mean, uh, it's a matter of one or two projects, so one or two uh, little uh, easy exercises uh, for uh, every, everyone to be familiar with this program. Uh, I don't think that uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a problem. It is a software. It is a it is a free software. Okay, this is, this software was developed by professionals. I mean, it is developed by uh, Rosa Doran, uh, which is actually an astronomer and teacher, of course. Uh, and it's uh, I think it's quite easy. I mean, I have uh, I I am using this program for almost. Uh, three or four years with my students, all ages, so from 12 to 18, and uh, uh, we have minor problems. I mean, we don't have something special uh, as far as concerns, but you know, students are very familiar with all these uh, tools, all these internet and software uh, tools. Uh, uh, I sometimes believe that they are even more familiar than uh, we are. And I think this is uh, this is what uh, all uh, teachers are uh, uh, realizing all over the world. They are digital natives. Yeah. Digital natives. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, my my son uh, first uh, touch screen uh, when he was one year old. I first uh, touch, I first touched the touch screen when I was 32. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, actually this <laughs> actually the point. Uh, if do we don't have any other question, no. Eight. Okay. So we are looking forward to see you, and we encourage you, all of you to participate in our pilots. You can be informed for everything uh, of our resources, of our good practices uh, on the website of MARC, marcscience.eu, or at the umbrella project of STEM at scientix.eu. Thank you very much, Rini, for inviting us. Thank you, Jacko. There was one question uh, about uh, the age of uh, your slides. Uh, okay, Marina. Uh, is it possible to have slides? You will have the slides in the Creative Classroom group, so the recording as well in the uh, YouTube channel. So you will find everything there. I have your emails by registering here. So in order to receive your certificate, I'm posting also here as a very short survey, so in case uh, you didn't write uh, the full name, so I won't have it for your certificate if you can uh, reply in this uh, Google form. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, John. Thank you, Marina. Uh, it was really interesting, and I think you gave us lots of ideas that uh, teachers uh, can implement in their projects. Uh, so this is our last expert talk, but uh, for the people that are in the Creative Classroom group, don't forget that I'm waiting uh, for you tomorrow to have, uh, it's fun here, but to have more fun as we are going to have our summer online party, and we have prepared different things uh, in our group, so I'm looking forward to see you and have fun. Uh, so, uh, presentation, everything will be in the group. Thank you. Thank you, and hope you have a nice uh, evening, and hope to see you soon again somewhere online. Okay. Thank you. We oui, thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye, and have a nice summer. <laughs> you too, you too. Joyful summer. Joyful, yeah. Joy. Okay.